Welcome to Sources, Kena Academy's interview series in which we explore the connection between history and culture. I'm Andrew Zornerman, your host. Today's program is our inaugural interview, and we could not be more honored than to have as our inaugural guest the renowned historian, classical scholar, and social commentator, Victor Davis Hansen. Dr. Hansen's scholarly work ranges from historical studies on the Peloponnesian War to the demise of classical studies in the American Academy. Just this last fall, his latest book was released. It's titled, The Second World Wars, How the First Global Conflict Was Fought and Won. Today's interview focuses on classical education, its historical role in American culture, and what it might hold for our future. Dr. Hansen, thank you for joining me today. In fact, thank you for hosting this event here at the Hoover Institution, where you serve as a fellow. Thank you for having me. Let's begin by defining a key term. Classical, I once heard you remark, means what is lasting, what is best or highest. Could you elaborate on that, please? Well, we use classical in every kind of context. Classical cars, it comes from a Latin word classis, meaning ship or fleet, actually a category. But what makes one car classical and another not? Or what makes a house a classical Victorian and another just a regular Victorian house? And I think there's a general consensus that something over time and space is acknowledged as enduring. And that would mean a work of, so in the case of the ancient world, Sophocles, Antigone, or Homer's Iliad, wherever that is read or known across time and space, it's recognized as something that is pertinent, relevant for the particular age at any time. So it's really about endurance, something that by general consensus won't go away. Is there something like um, a highest purpose to classical education, something that we would want our students to attain and prepares them most for the world? Well, classical education, by definition, is not going to be di uh, vocational in the sense of business or engineering. So it's always going to be a little different. However we, however we describe it at the high school level, college, bachelor's, master's degree, PhD, or just autodidactic, but the purpose of it is, uh, it's sort of outlined in Cicero's Pro Archia. It's to make a person have a liberal temper, and not in the modern sense of liberal, of course, but to be open to new ideas and yet to try to place experiences, ideas, thought in a context. So the classical mind says this is the debate against or for abortion or this is a problem with North Korea, just to take a contemporary examples. How can I analyze those or appreciate those within a typology? So then the, the classical mind says, this is Thucydides' take on human nature, or this is what Homer says about war, or this is what Sophocles says about war. And so it offers the classically trained person something to work with so that it's not, you're not a groundhog day, all, always rediscovering the world every day. And then besides that practical aim, there's an aesthetic to it. And that is it's trying to teach people that it's not just what you end up as or what you, uh, you accomplish in the material sense, but it's how you do it. It's, it's a method, it's a process, it's an attitude of seeking beauty wherever you can find it. And as Socrates says, treating people the way you would like to be treated. And so it's a, a, an ethos, so you, and you want to inculcate an some kind of ethos about aesthetics and the way people treat each other. Bring philosophy down from the clouds and make it a human experience. In many classical education uh, circles, advocates often zero in on the, the trivium and the quadrivium. It's kind of the well-defined framework by which we understand classical education. The standard there is fundamentally a scholastic one. But do you have a different concept? Do you have a, a more historical or more expansive notion of classical education? I think I do, and part of it is that although I was trained as a philologist here at Stanford, quite narrowly, textual critic, that was what the program was in the PhD uh, experience in the 1970s. But I taught for 21 years, mostly minority students, and by the 
the statutes of the California State University, you have to average 25 students in a class. And that's very hard when you're trying to have introductory Greek, introductory Latin to non-traditional students. So you become an emissary. And so what I would try to, to redefine a uh, classical program or protocol would be sort of an archaeological component so people could see the practical uh, story of the past and material history, literature, and language. And that somewhat similar to the medieval approach, but it was uh, the idea that I could take a student and I can say, uh, here's uh, a trireme, or I would go into a class and say, here's a trireme. Now you use those four approaches and tell me what, what you know about it. And they would say, well, here's the archaeological remains, or here's a duplicate that's in Athens today, or here's what Thucydides says about a sea battle, or here's uh, what a person uses as a literary um, uh, metaphor using a trireme, and here's what the Greek word for it is. So I was trying to at least develop some kind of framework so whatever problem came up, they would not just think it's, it's just general and vague and what do I do? So I would go into a room and say to the students, uh, column, temple, now use four di connected disciplines to tell me what you know about it. And, and the purpose obviously was to transfer that way of thinking, of a finite way of looking at the world to other fields, whether it's politics or human relations. Mm -hmm. I like that term you used, uh, emissary. It's clear that many of your students would not be the typical classical education student, the profile of a student taking the liberal arts, and uh, you were really trying to carve out culture among them where they wouldn't get it otherwise, right? Yeah, I, I think from 1984, and I also needed a job. I was hired as a part-time Latin teacher, so I needed the students to justify what later became a department or a program of about five professors full-time. But you had to tell people why you should invest two to three thousand hours is what you end up with with Latin and Greek per year mm -hmm. and what's the purpose when their parents are saying we're scrimping and saving these are the only first people in our family wh why don't you tell them to go into law or why don't you tell them to go into engineering and you try to explain that they can do that with classics they can do anything mm -hmm. because they've mastered the written and spoken word they have a framework of history and literature to collate events with and they have a sense of the aesthetic. So we would always try to have students speak English, many of them were not native English, and as an art form. And we would say, don't repeat vocabulary, seek Latin variatio, and uh, use alliteration, or use rhetorical tropes. So we were trying to create the spoken and written word as an art form. That's wonderful. I think a lot of us, are first introduced to Victor Davis Hanson by way of uh, lectures online that we've heard, or maybe we saw you as one of the commentators on the wonderful series on the Greeks. And uh, we think of you as an historian. And I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about w the important reasons, the most important reasons young people should study history as part of a classical training. Well, I think what we all, when we start our education, whether it's formal or autodidactic, it's just a blur, and what we want is structure. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the past, uh, we want to ask ourselves, what are the main events in the world? Are the, the Greeks and the Romans? And within that, and then we go into the Dark Ages, medieval. So we would always want to have a system, in our own minds at least, that we're going to be systematic. We're going to start with the Greeks, and there's nowhere else really. They're a little bit in the Middle East, but. There's no written record, as we call it, as true history until Herodotus. And then we want to progress. And so if you can establish a framework when you tell the student, this is what Greek history is, and this is what Roman history is. And the other stuff is not history. So um, it might be very impressive to have Hittite cuneiform texts, but we don't have individuals apart from the state reinterpreting c contemporary or past events, often to the displeasure of people in power. That's history, and we want to use this framework now. Now that we've done it with the Greece and Rome, you can do it for any period. And then the other thing, I think it's really important to teach people that a historian is not a uh, scribe, and he's not uh, a recorder. What the historian does is he picks and chooses. 
with Thucydides has a 27 and a half year history of the Peloponnesian War, but he doesn't cover, uh, in theory it's 27 and a half years, but he doesn't cover really 11 years he breaks off in mid-sentence. Mm -hmm. Some things become very important in history, like the Melian Dialogue, but if we were to look at other sources, it doesn't seem to be that important. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to teach the student, we try to remind ourselves that what the historian chooses to emphasize or leave out or exaggerate or critique is part of a literary creative process. And you just don't open a book and say, he said it and therefore it's true, and, this per and he says this, this, and that's important. You want to be an active, proactive reader and say, Thucydides says this, but my gosh, he didn't say that, and he, he left out this. And I think that discrimination really is important to, to inculcate very early. Mm. So it's probably fair to, to conclude that you would consider history to be a liberal art. Some yeah. practitioners of classical studies don't. No, I do. I think yeah. it's a, a literary form as well. Mm. So the, the historian, whether it's Thucydides, I think has 141 speeches of some sort, whether they're indirect or direct. And he's an artist, and so he, he tells us himself, sort of in contradictory forms, I made speakers say what I thought they said based on my research ability, but it, in other cases I make them say what they should have spoken get, given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to use his skills as an artist to recapture something that he might not have actually heard, mm -hmm. but he feels it represents some sort of higher truth and then you can discuss whether that's legitimate or not. But again, it's in the confines of a literary artist. I think that's true of all the great historians, whether it's Gibbon or Parkman or Prescott, that they were, and we've forgotten that, they were great stylists and they had imagination. That narrative uh, art of sweeping history has been sort of lost because of compartmentalization and the idea that hi history has to take place within the confines of a PhD system. In, uh, in teaching Herodotus and Thucydides, did you ever run into the uh, challenge with your students where they, having read Herodotus, they didn't take to Thucydides because of the big style difference? I did, all the time. And yeah. uh, it was, most people when they read stories in Herodotus about uh, Solon or Gyges, it's obviously stories from Herodotus, they're more entertaining, mm -hmm. especially the 300 at Thermopylae, that seemed to be most important. So when they, when they would read, Thucydides' narrative, the non-speeches, the narrative, this happened, and the next year when the corn got ripe, they did this and this. Uh, they were not attracted to Thucydides as much. That being said, after they were in the program, meaning the classical uh, education program of literature and history, after two or three years, they began to look back at Thucydides' speeches. Pericles fumeration, mm -hmm. um, the Mytilenean debate, the stasis of Corsaira, and they, they felt that they were much richer than Herodotus. I don't know whether that's a, an accurate estimation or not, but it, it, it usually seemed to me that students in their third and fourth year became addicted to Thucydides, especially mm -hmm. his speeches and his, his prose style, at least how both in Greek and how it was translated into English, in a way that they, they found Herodotus is not so challenging or not so insightful. And of course, that's an age-old debate whether it's accurate or not. It just seems that students start out liking Herodotus better, but then some end up appreciating a more subtle or sophisticated approach by Thucydides. I think students who were enamored of the emergence of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, might take to Thucydides a little bit more sort of a the, the stage, the drama that's being set for uh, the rise of philosophy. Do you think that's true? I do. I think especially his pessimistic view of human nature that's more overt than Herodotus's, and his idea that the gods don't really uh, direct things, and although there is hubris and there's nemesis uh, that follows, it's still a human thing, as he says at one point in his history. So they're, they're very interested in Thucydides because he, he keeps saying human nature being what it is. Hmm. And so you can predict what Nicias is going to do once he outlines his hesitancy. A good man who will do a bad thing. And he, you can understand that Alcibiades is a reckless, dangerous person that's got innate talent. And uh, that's true with all these people. Pericles is a brilliant leader who really is an aggressive imperialist 
and has a strategy that should in almost every case has worked, but it will not work against the Spartans in this particular war. And so he's, he's full of this tragic sense that bad people can be useful and good people can do bad things and great people can lead you to doom. And uh, Spartans should be unimaginative, they should be plotting because of the system that produces them, and then all of a sudden you see Gylippus or Brasidas uh, or Lysander, and it turns out that oddballs in Sparta, maybe bastards, maybe half-citizens, whatever their circumstances, they're more brilliant than anybody. That's what's always exciting about Thucydides, is the paradox, contradictions. You've commented that classical education was once commonly shared in America. And uh, can you recount that story for us a bit and why classical education slipped in prominence? Well, as late as 1918, in a country that was about 120 million people, there were about a million students enrolled in Latin. And that's no longer true today, of course, that Latin is not the basis of uh, an education. When I grew up in a Victorian farmhouse in which I still live. When I was in high school, I saw my grandfather's Latin books. So here I was in high school and in my first years at UC Santa Cruz, and I would be studying Latin, and I'd come back and go climb on this old shelf and these dusty books from 1911, 1910, 19, and they were Latin, and I started using... Um, and those were public schools where yes, your grandfather and you attended? Yes, Selma High School, which was a very impoverished rural community, and it's got terrible, I mean, it's, it's just has, I don't want to be pejorative, but its schools are not working today. Mm -hmm. And yet when I see this retrogression, it almost makes one cry because you, you know that if you were to reintroduce Latin into the curriculum, and University High School in Fresno has, re requires two years, and it's usually rated in the top five based on test scores in college, uh, preparatory uh, courses and then success in college of its graduates in the entire state. And it's largely because of that, because this Latin curriculum, I mean, what, what, why is, would that be? It improves your vocabulary, it gives a person a structure of grammar which they can reverse in reverse fashion apply to English. It reminds them that it's not just what you say, but how you say it, and you want to be artistic as well as factual. Uh, it teaches students all sorts of things, but I think the, ma the, the main value of it, it gives you a framework. This is syntax, this is grammar, this is vocabulary, all that other stuff is outside. It's, not, it, it's just fluff, it's therapeutic, and, and you're going to master this, and you're going to learn uh, what the cases of a noun are. They do exist in English, you never knew they did, but once you know Latin, you know, you'll see what the tenses are in English. And once they get that grammar established, it's, it's quite astonishing to see the transformation in a young student. I would have students at Cal State Fresno that had four years of Latin, four years of Greek, and I, I don't want to be too bombastic, but it was pretty clear they could speak and write better than faculty members in certain sociological or therapeutic disciplines, and that caused a lot of tension. They would be in classes and write papers, or they would ask questions in a way that the professor didn't like. Because also, by doing that, they have sort of a disinterested approach to learning. And the biggest things that plague us today on young students, unfortunately, is that in this therapeutic curriculum we have, they tend to be arrogant and they tend to be ignorant. That's a fatal combination. They're, they're very zealous about a particular contemporary issue, but they don't have the linguistic skills or the prose-style skills or the analytical skills to really make a successful argument, much less do they have a body of knowledge, historical, they can, they can draw back on, for examples. And yet, uh, they're quite confident in their limited ability. Let's keep pushing on this um, very interesting recollection of yours, of your grandfather's high school education and yours. So if you could counsel those of us who either direct or build secondary schools in the United States, I'm guessing that you would encourage everyone to study Latin, maybe study Greek as well. Yeah. What about other things? For example, uh, if you would continue to develop uh, your ideas about writing, r rhetoric, uh, expository writing, yeah. the, the traditional essay, what would, you, what would you tell us? What would you direct us to do? Well, one of the things that I tried to do in, in, in regard to that question was I, I really put a high premium on 
public speaking just because in the ancient world you see these magnificent speeches and although some of them were obviously written down you get the impression that whether it's a general before his troops or whether it's a politician trying to sway uh, to, to obtain a 51 percent majority that public speaking was very important and even in di private dialogue in Roman literature and Aristophanes, you see that there's a subtlety and a mastery of the spoken word. So what I would always tell students is, we're not going to allow you to have any notes when you, and they had to give oral reports as well. And I would grade them just as much on their delivery. So we would even read the De Oratory, and we'd see how do you use your hands or how do you use your head and uh, which words do you emphasize, which do you glide over. I don't want you to say, ah, 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 you know, you know, you know, you know, because it, you, you want to put your name on this speech just like you would paint a picture or write an essay. And that tended to be very successful because I found that when they went out for interviews, they would prepare for an interview. And I'd always try to suggest you want to be anticipatory. You don't want to just be passive in an interview. What would you ask yourself if you were on the other? And then can you craft a speech, sort of like a classical speech where the last paragraph is it anticipates criticism. As to my opponents who will say this, that rhetorical trope. And then the other thing was, uh, I think there's something to do with the spirit of the classical world that we, they don't really have a scholastic or an academic profile until later on in the post-Roman era where it was, and they did very important work, scribes and scholars, etc. But as we understand education from the classical world, it, there was an element of physicality. So I would always try to suggest to students, if you're taking Latin or Greek, keep riding your bike, keep working at the drugstore. Um, try to make sure that you're physically as robust or healthy or you have some experience with the underclass as well as uh, this refinement process that's ongoing. What we don't want to do is take a group out of society and then educate it and use our refinements of education and then make it somehow detached. I think that's been the tragedy of um, uh, higher education in America, especially at the graduate level, that we tell students that within this small little tribal context, they wrote a PhD thesis on the gender ambiguity of the cult of Dionysus in Asia Minor. And, and it's impressive, but then when you ask that person, um, have you ever driven a tractor? Uh, do you hike up in the mountains? Do you um, know how far Athens is from Sparta? Or um, any of these practical questions that average people, if they got to know them, would know, they, they're clueless. I used to get in trouble when I would interview applicants for Greek and Latin professorships because they wanted just, of course, to talk about their thesis. And they were very impressive theses, but they were very narrow. And I'd always say things like, why do you think the Mycenaean world collapsed? Isn't that crazy? It collapsed. And they wouldn't have an answer. And I said, why do you think that uh, Latin doesn't have a definite article? Or why is there an optative mood in Greek? That's weird. And they would kind of get flustered, and I said, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm just trying to reflect the questions I get asked every day by students. Mm -hmm. So we want you to be aware of the larger community and what it would be like to t a student in your class, rather than think that because you have a PhD from Stanford or Harvard or Berkeley, then you're going to set the tone, and this is all you need to know. And the narrower and narrower you get, the safer and safer becomes the landscape in which you operate. We don't want that. We want you to take risk and be broad and be part of the larger community. Because of the divisions that we have in our society, where we have, you described it very cleverly about the, the profile of the high tech, highly trained, well educated man or woman, say here in the Bay Area, who can't use a chainsaw, right? And then there are plenty of people in, in your hometown who use chainsaws and trucks and tractors, who are also very facile with computers and, and other technology. I wonder if you would go further, given, given where the state of our culture is, would you include uh, non-liberal arts in a secondary training? For example, would you reintroduce the industrial arts only not as a track for the vocational students, but rather as just part of the training of the typical American young person who maybe needs to make up some lost ground as a human being. 
I would, and partly it's a prejudice because my father started a vocational training junior college, but uh, he was interested in, uh, to apply that vocational training within a, curric a traditional curriculum as well. Mm -hmm. And so one of the pleasures of coming up to Hoover is I get about five or six weeks mm -hmm. off and I can teach again, and I, I, I choose to teach at Hillsdale College rather than in this area. And one of the things I like about it, they have uh, certain elements where people work out in the community, but more, and they do things like teach people how to shoot pistols, or they they become expert marksmen. And uh, it's been fascinating for me to, to talk to young women, for example, who will give me a lecture. I grew up with guns, and yet they know more about guns, and they probably shot more guns in one year at Hillsdale than I have the last ten years. And I'm always. Uh, surprised when I see young people. I just talked to a person today on the fo phone who's a Fresno State student, but he's also a solar panel operator and installer. And when he starts talking about wire gauges and um, wiring diagrams, well beyond my competence, I really admire that. So he, he does that and then he goes to school. And it seems to me that that would be a dose of needed reality for the academic world. And for young privileged students, even at the undergraduate level, as you suggest, that especially those who are in private liberal arts, very expensive, and I know there's a lot of pressure on their parents and they to, to get the maximum amount of achievement, academic achievement for further professional training and employment, but it seems to me that universities should start to introduce different sorts of experiences along with the academic. Was your father a scholar as well? No, he was uh, from a very poor Swedish immigrant family, mm -hmm. and uh, he and his uh, first cousin, whose parents had died and he adopted, uh, joined the Marine Corps, and they had a pretty tough time in World War II. He flew in a B-29 over Japan, and was almost killed another time, and my, uh, his my uncle was Victor Hansen, was killed in Okinawa, but he was a big Swedish, very physical guy, but he was very well educated. He got a master's degree and he became a junior college administrator. And, and then I was very lucky because my mother had grow, grown up in the house that I live in. I'm the fifth generation, the same house. And you wouldn't think that she would say, we would, when I said I want to study Latin and Greek, she said, wonderful. She didn't say, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. She was one of the first women to graduate here at Stanford Law School in 1946, and she was one of the um, first f female Superior Court judge in Fresno County, and then I think she was the second appellate court judge woman appointed in the 70s by Jerry Brown. But the point I'm making about that is that we would also sell fruit from our farm at farmer's market. So she, here was she was a, a appellate court judge, one step below the California Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And on weekends in her 60s, she would be peddling fruit in Santa Cruz or Palo Alto. We'd drive over. And then she would tie vines. And that, that was really inculcated uh, in me. If, if I, I remember came home, I came home once from graduate school at Stanford, and my father said, so what are you doing up there? And I said, you know, we're, I have a fascinating Greek prose class from Lionel Pearson, very famous. And he comes in, and he speaks in English, we take dictation, and we have to write it in, into Greek first and then to Latin. Mm. And he said, well, do you know how to <laughs> wire the pump? Do you know anything about 220? And I said, well, not really. And he said, well, what the hell is the purpose? <laughs> and then my mother would argue with him and say, well, here's the purpose. But I got, a, I got, I got both sides was very good. They were wonderful parents. I was very lucky. Can we talk a little bit about some of the great texts? So let's just start with this kind of general question. What do you think are the top classic texts for preparing a young person to understand and to engage the world? Yeah. Well, that's a difficult question because it involves two criteria. What can a young person access and understand mm -hmm. versus what would be the richest educational experience for them? I think I would answer that by saying if a young person introduced to the ancient world would want to read something like uh, Plato's Apology, uh, one good play, uh, one or two, m and I'm kind of perverse because I've always favored plays like Euripides' Bacchae or the Medea. Euripides seems to me uh, easiest for a younger student of modern because he's the most psychological of the tragedians, and he, 
he's in some ways the most tragic, even though Sophocles was supposed to have enjoyed that reputation. Uh, people don't read Xenophon anymore, but Xenophon, he's got some great scenes in the Hellenica, whether it's uh, Theramenes trying to hold the bima before he's hauled off, and uh, the Anabases as well. So I know that I'm kind of mimicking what students that begin Greek do, what the text that they read, but, and then as a student matures, uh, I think Thucydides as we've spoken, Homer of course is mm. preeminent, Odyssey. Students like the Odyssey, it's easier for them to read and then later on they start to appreciate the Iliad more for some reason. Virgil's Aeneid is always important for students. I, I, I've had a ex good experience teaching young kids Horace's Odes. There's something about them that they, certain phrases, I leave you a, a monument more lasting in bronze or carpe diem, whatever it is, it, 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 they, they, they're, they're not jingles, but they catch on and they quote them and they, they provide a form of reference. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but I think one of the most brilliant things that students appreciate is Petronius' Satyricon because it's got such a frightening parallel to the wages of, of affluence and leisure in a modern society such as our own. So when they read about Encolpius or Gaetan, they start to, whether it's transgenderism or decad so-called decadence, it, it's, it really strikes them. Another one is uh, Suetonius' Twelve Caesar and of course the brilliant Tacitus. And so one of the things that's, that, that, that's valuable at classics at this particular period in the richest and most powerful nation in the world is that a lot of these texts are pessimistic in nature about human nature. And they, they warn us not about being too poor or not about working too hard, but they romanticize, whether it's Virgil's Eclogue or Hesiod's Works and Days, they romanticize hard work, community, even poverty to some extent, and what they worry about is an excess of material bounty and too much leisure. These seems to be, as Catullus says, these are what ruin civilization, cities. So classical education uh, is rooted in an, another ancient notion of what it means to become educated, to be let out, right? Yes. And uh, so I, th I think you've just touched on something like uh, a beginning pull, like where students should be let out yeah. from, right? Yes. What about the end game? So via their education, where should they land? Well, I always viewed it in the sense, in the sense that once a student leaves a formal high school or college program, you want to have inculcated the framework and the skills or the methodology that they can go for the rest of their lives with, the, with that method and, be, and they can read Dante or they can read Huck Finn, whatever, it, wh whatever the particular field is, or they can read more history, or they can do mathematics and science, but they have a uh, dual methodology. And what, the, what is that dual methodology? The first is that they are inductive. They have a method. They say to themselves, I'm not going to start with a deductive supposition and then make examples fit it, but I'm going to have an open mind. If uh, I want to vote for Hillary Clinton, I'm not going to say she's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. I'm going to look at certain issues empirically and then I'm going to come to an, it might not be one that the professor likes, but the method is there. And then the second thing that a person needs as they go out from a formal training is they need a frame of reference. They need reference points so that they don't get up every day and have to, to repeat or endure the same thing. So if they're in a, a uh, they're a young woman at uh, an office and they feel they've been passed over and their wise counsel is neglected. They say this is what happened uh, in a serious context to Antigone or remember what Lysistrata did about it. Uh, so they have a frame of reference that stays with them the rest of their life. So it, once a student has a methodology and they know that they can bring in examples from history or I don't want to end up uh, like Solon, or I really admire uh, Brasidas, or I really think that uh, that I want to be like Leonidas. Wh whatever that is stays with them, and it, it teaches them or encourages them to find other reference. Uh, Battle of the Bulge, or uh, the first day at Normandy, or the retreat to Choisson Reservoir. Whatever it is, they need to build a corpus of facts, dates, 
biography, and then for the rest of their life they can say, yeah, that reminds me of what Grant said. Or don't you remember what happened uh, when Daniel Webster made that speech? So I think that's really important, and that can be taught through classics especially. Mm. It's an ancient idea. Mm. How about on the sort of the purposeful end of things in terms of their the students, you know, graduating from, from a classical school or maybe from a classical program at a university, would you be encouraged to see more of those students in terms of the future of the country? In other words, is there something about the national culture that would really benefit from, from more students uh, graduating from classical programs? I think it would. I think what people, people worry about is that, um, that language is becoming bastardize or it's not it's just a, a rough grunt Twitter form of uh, pre grammatical communication so when you turn on the television news or you see debates so if you go back my stu I used to sh refer students to the Buckley Al, uh, William Buckley and Gore Vidal debate I didn't care what their politics were but that repartee that wit that personal invective, the use of vocabulary and allusion, metaphor, simile, was very effective, and they they, they were glued when they, they saw that, and uh, and so I think it's really important that students uh, that we have a generation I shouldn't say just students that are starting to re 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 look at the English language and try to say you know it's really becoming something that's almost Neanderthal. It's just a we're training students or a young generation has a vocabulary of about 800 words. Can't we expand that to 4,000 so they don't? So when I listen to President Trump and he says, tremendous, 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 that's fantastic, fantastic, great, I, I, I want to say there, there's a thesaurus that you could expand that vocabulary and it would help you, it would, it would enrich your, your argument. So I, I, I think that's very important. The other thing is that we, we're really starving for people that have reference. We don't have anybody, we, we suffer from the arrogance of the present, so everybody says, this is the worst scandal in history. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to America. This is the worst present we've ever seen. And, and you're thinking, well, why don't, wouldn't it be more effective to say, this reminds me of Millard Fillmore, or maybe he's getting into James Buchanan territory. Even if your audience doesn't know it, they might develop some interest to know it. But we don't have any comparative typology because we don't know anything about the past. So in a practical sense, I'd like to see students emerge from this gymnasium or high school or whatever we, we call it with the ability to speak well, the ability to refer people to events in the past, and the ability to be empirical. And, uh, and and not just deductive or, or just hyper-partisan. And one of the things that, uh, I guess that what I think is one of the great themes of classical literature, it's irony, ironeia, the Greek idea that things are not quite what you think uh, all the time and things that should not happen do happen and the unexpected is should be considered the expected whether it's in military campaigns or it's just in daily life. And so we, we have to get this idea that maybe for the wrong reasons, if you're a right-wing conservative, for the wrong reasons and for the wrong motives, Bill Clinton can have d done something that was good for the country. And if you're a left-wing partisan, how ironic that maybe somebody in the middle class got a break from a Trump tax cut. So I think we're just, we're not open to the idea of paradox and irony and, and um, we are open to this idea of cynicism and sarcasm, but it'd be better to extend that to include irony. There might not be anyone in the country as uh, learned and helpful as you are about uh, the history of the Peloponnesian War, and I, I was wondering if you could share with us some thoughts about how to lead students into the study of Thucydides. Uh, in particular, uh, early on in his history, he lays down a concept of history and uh, I think you, you mentioned already something of his anthropology, his, his view on human nature. Can you explain a little bit more about um, his concept of history and whether or not history itself has proven that concept to hold up pretty well? Well, he makes a very st famous statement in the first book 
section, I think it's 21, 22, 23 in that area. And he says that his history is going to be valuable and it will be, I think the term is, he uses esto a e, it's going to be forever. And the reason is not that we are going to think the Peloponnesian War, which he says is the greatest war, in, he thinks, in the Hellenic experience, but he's smart enough or astute enough to know that people will change, the players will be different, there will be greater wars, but what will make his history valuable across time and space is that he captures human nature and human motivation. And so once you understand the Peloponnesian War and the central ironies or the central themes of it, then you can apply that to almost any history. So whether we like it or not, he believes that history is didactic because it, it assumes one overarching principle that human nature will not change. And that's a very unpopular concept today because most people think that we're our brain so our, 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 the hard wiring in our brain is changing because of video games or cell phones or new disciplines or uh, increased uh, diet and, and cha radically changed material conditions that we can pretty much replace human nature. So we have all of these uh, social science efforts to make us wealthier, healthier, better people. But Thucydides says, no, you try it, you can people within certain parameters, but they're going to act predictably. And uh, they're going to be driven, as he says, about Athenians who think they have to maintain the, air, the empire. He says, why do they do these things? They do it, and he has two, two speakers say this explicitly, they do it for a sense of honor or perceived self-interest, or they act out of Dale's fear. I think he's right about that. That's what, what makes it timeless. All right, so you're fresh off of a wonderful study on the Second World War, as you put it, the Second World Wars. And uh, so put Thucydides to the test there. So how does he illuminate both the events, the political events leading up to the war and to um, its execution and its outcomes? Yeah. Well, I think he believes in deterrence. And so why does Sparta invade in, four, in 431 BC in a way that they hadn't the last 20 years. And I think the answer is that rightly or wrongly they feel that they can. They can go into Attica and nobody's going to stop them. They know that there's a naval deterrent, but they're not convinced it's an immediate deterrent. In other words, the Athenians have not been able to establish the principle you don't set foot one, one foot in my property, which they apply to the Thebans later on in the, de in the Delian. I mean, uh, Pagandas, the, the general, and Hippocrates, the Athenian general, they have matched speeches about deterrence. So he says that once Sparta thinks that they can get away with it and Athens and retaliates, then you have an asymmetrical war. And the, the key chief question, the mystery of his history is who's going to adapt first? Will Athens be able to create an army and go down and destroy Sparta and free the Helots in the fashion that Epaminondas, three generations, Two, gen two and a half generations later will? Or will Sparta develop a navy and, dis and dissect the Athenian Empire and starve it out? It turns out, again, ironically, that the blinkered Spartans are more versatile and they're better at enlisting allies than the supposedly cosmopolitan Athenians. And when we look at the World War II, it's the same question. These very limited, I mean, they're continental powers, Italy and Germany, to take the European theater. And they're, in the case of Germany, nursing wounds over Versailles and, are, and they have a head start and they have a fascistic idea that the spirit is much more important than the material in the Napoleonic fashion. And the question simply is, are we going to be able to destroy the democracies and not become arrogant in the process before the mighty giant of the United States, Soviet Union, and Great Britain together combined against us. And it looks like they pull it off from 1939 to probably uh, somewhere around June of 42. And then, of course, Ubris kicks in. They do very stupid things like declare war. They being the Germans, the Italians, they declare war on us rather than vice versa. They invade, earlier invade the Soviet Union. Japan attacks Pearl Harbor. And then the fascists that are basically controlling the world, they have what is now the EU, 
much of North Africa. In the case of the Japanese Empire, is even larger than the Third Reich, all the way from the Arctic Circle. If you say, where's Japan, Germany, and Italy? It's the Arctic Circle, the Sahara Desert, and it's the English Channel to the Volga River by 1942. And yet, they miss calculate and they get themselves into a war, a Sicilian expedition or an invasion against the Scythians with about the only countries that can destroy them, and that's the 400 million people of Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And then they make another classical Thucydidean error. They start a war without asking a fundamental question in the manner that Athens did. How can I destroy my ability, the, in, the ability of my enemy to make war. How can I go into their homeland and destroy them so they cannot field an army? And the answer is, does Germany have an aircraft carrier? No. Does Italy? No. Do they have a four-engine bomber? No. Does Japan have a four-engine bomber? Are any of them able to bomb factories on the other side of the Ural Mountains in Russia? Can they reach Detroit? No. And is the, tru is the opposite true of the United States? Can they reach Berlin, <laughs> Tokyo? Can the Soviet Union get to, yes, they can. And so they, they, they start a war with a power, in, especially in the United States, economically, whose potential they have no idea about. And yet they, they've somehow translated border wars, and in the case of Japan, inheriting orphan countries from defunct countries like France and the Netherlands that don't exist anymore in 1941 as autonomous countries. And they've been very, um, they've been sort of scavenging the colonial spoils and then they translate that success into a global war as if they, you know, they can produce 90% of the world's aviation <laughs> fuel or they can build a Liberty ship every three days or a, a B-24 bomber every hour. And they have no ability, no, it's not that they don't have any ability, they have no concept about do Thucydides, uh, Plato, and Aristotle say um, illuminate or anticipate uh, by their writings uh, the profiles of major players like Hitler and Churchill? Yeah, I think they do, especially in a formal sense if one were to read Aristotle's politics where he and his ethics where he talks about typologies of government, mm -hmm. and what oligarchy does and what is aristocracy does and what dem demagogues do and what radical democracies do, and he, he pretty much also forecast what happens in the mentality, as does Thucydides, of someone in Britain or France around 1933 or 34, when they won World War I. They're starting to feel a little bit guilty about the Versailles Treaty, and we have this asymmetrical situation where the people who lost World War I feel aggrieved and they want to fight again. And the people who won do not want to fight. And the more that you appease, the more you try to rationalize uh, the interest of the enemy, the more that Chamberlain or Daladier did that, the more a classical mind would say, you're showing a great magnanimity, but unfortunately given the nature of the person you're showing to, it's going to be seen as weakness to be exploited rather than a concession to be appreciated and reciprocated upon. And again, that requires a pessimistic estimation of, and an idea that countries uh, keep safe by deterrence because there's always a weak link in the chain of the global community of one aggressive power who will try to take advantage. And you can get very innocent, noble people killed if you allow them to be vulnerable. And so. What I like about classical literature is it kind of cuts through modern pretensions of morality and it basically says that if you lose the rule of law as happened at Corsaira, or you have an arrogant person uh, in this, in, as Xerxes, they're going to take and take and take. Or there's going to be violence and violence and violence once this thin veneer of civilization is peeled away and you're going to need people to stand up and do some very terrible things to stop it and restore civility and not realize that peace is not the natural, as Plato says, it's not the natural situation. It's a parenthesis. I have a final question for you. If there's one symbol that was born in Greek antiquity and stands as a source of normative authority for our time, 
its philosophy, the love of wisdom, the way of life, as Socrates put it. Perhaps our culture forgets about the affective part of the relationship to wisdom. What is your mind on that? How best can we foster love of wisdom among our students? Philosophy had existed before Athens, mostly in, in Sicily and, and especially in Ionia along what is now the Turkish coast. But what happened in Athens is, we're, at least as Aristophanes caricatured and as Plato reminded us, he brought it down from the heaven. And it's no longer cosmology or it's what we would call geology or, or any of the hard sciences. It's the, it's the philosophy of how to get along with people. It's a human experience. And what Socrates was trying to do was fabricate a code of behavior and ethics. And it was predicated on a pessimistic view of human nature, of course, but it was also sort of a pre-Christian idea that ultimately you don't want to do anybody any harm, not because you're better than they are, not necessarily because a divine spirit told you to do that, although th there is this divinity that we're all imprinted with a moral sense on birth, but it's also uh, reciprocal, it's utilitarian. If you were to do something wrong, you're going to A, warp your inner soul and then there's going to be consequences, but in a utilitarian Socratic sense, then the system won't work if everybody does what you do. If you cheat on your income taxes, you're going to have to have some kind of accounting maybe in the hereafter because you did something that was morally wrong, but then you have to also assume that you are special and that nobody else can cheat on their income taxes. Because if everybody were to do that, there won't be any revenue for the state and your own family will be hurt. So it's this awareness that you are a member of a polis, a polity, and there's a code of behavior that is predicated that everybody has to assume that they act in a certain way predicate on what they want other people to act like as well. And if you start to make hubristic um, exceptions for your own behavior, then you have to assume that other people are going to do it. And this is the, the veneer of civilization is going to be torn off and it's going to start to descend into a, the law, of a Hobbesian law of the jungle. I think that's a very valuable idea that philosophy is both moral in the sense that we have souls and a duality between the physical and the corporal. but it's also practical because it's a way, it's a handbook of how people in a community have to act to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Just a quick follow-up. So you described that moment as a kind of a pre-Christian moment. Yes. And in the, the life of Socrates, the, the thought of Plato and Aristotle were happily and very fruitfully absorbed into Latin Christian culture centuries later. Do you... Um, do, you, do any of the, the great classical Christian writers uh, shape your mind and how you think about things, or Augustine on history, or Aquinas on the order of things, or the, the great medieval tradition of the relationship between faith and reason? Yeah, I do. I think St. Thomas Aquinas, but earlier Jerome and Augustine, and, and even the Rota Fortuna Boethius, and a lot of the Byzantine writers, and they can be in almost any subject. And what do I mean by that? Why do they um, appeal to me? And it's that if we look at the Gospels of Jesus Christ, the, the canonical Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, there's not a systematic uh, blueprint of what we're supposed to do that has to come later. And that requires somebody to say, how do I translate in a practical way and a divinity and a Christian thinking it's a radical idea to practical circumstances. So if somebody comes up to me and say, my son died, but he wasn't baptized. I, I look in the Gospels, I can't find an answer. Does he go to hell or does he go to heaven? Or I'm a, I've been a sinner for 10 years and yet I'm dying now of cancer and I want to repent. Do I, what, what do I do with the other 10 years? These are practical questions that the church was faced with. And to answer them, they had an advantage because they had the systematic approach to learning and inquiry that we talked about earlier, the empirical method, inductive method, and, and, and examples to draw on from classical literature. But more importantly, they had a, a moral body of thought that had said, going back to Plato, and even earlier, perhaps even Pythagoras, that there were souls that we have, and 
as I think Plato says, they're like musical tunes. You can't hear them, you can't see them. If I say, hey Jude, we all know what it is, but it doesn't become reified until you have a musical instrument. And that musical instrument is the body. Mm. So this thing that it can't smell, can't touch, can't see, as soon as we have a, a violin or a lyre or a guitar, then we can see it. And that's what our bodies are. But that we don't ever confuse that the guitar can make music on its own. It's just an instrument. So that's and that proved very conducive as a framework to interpret uh, Christianity and the thought of Jesus Christ because uh, he came from a separate tradition, but the combination of Jerusalem and Athens really codified Christian thought and it made it a practical idea and it incorporated ideas within classical thought that aren't in other bodies of thought in the non the non West that people are noble not just because Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount but because there was a prior tradition that said watch out for affluence so that sort of welding or melding of the two systems together was one of the most brilliant and mysterious developments in the history of Western civilization. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. And thanks to everyone in our audience for watching or listening. This is Andrew Zorneman for Kena Academy. We'll see you next time on Sources. Mm -hmm.